Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to be reading William Shakespeare's Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 5. And basically, I read some Shakespeare and I pause every once in a while to talk about it. So if you have questions, please leave them in the comments. This is kind of an interesting scene. We're going to meet perhaps the most infamous character in the entire play, Lady Macbeth. And um, she's got some things to say. <laughs> um, you'll see why she's so infamous before too long. So let's go ahead and... Um, dive right in. This is Lady Macbeth is Macbeth's wife. Uh, Lady's just the title. That's not her first name. Okay, Lady Macbeth enters the stage alone reading a letter. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. So the they is the witches, and this is a letter from Macbeth. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. While I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with Hail King that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. So a couple important things to point out about this letter. First off, practically speaking, it gives us a good recap of what's happened so far in the play. And Shakespeare does this every once in a while, um, probably because his audience wouldn't have had like watches or phones, obviously. So chances are you might show up to a play a little late. And here's a good chance to get, you know, a recap. Also, a lot of Shakespeare's audience wouldn't have been, you know, wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to school a lot. They might not have been literate. Uh, they might not have an education, a formal education at all, or might have stopped in fourth grade or eighth grade equivalent. So just like us, Shakespeare's ori original audience would have struggled from time to time to understand what he was saying. And having it repeated is a great way to catch up. So that's sort of in a practical sense. In terms of the story, there's also some really big things happening here. Two things I want to point out. First is the title that Macbeth gives uh, Lady Macbeth in the letter. He calls her his dearest partner of greatness. Now I'm married, so I understand you know calling your spouse by something other than their name. You don't always use their name, but usually you would call them love or um, I don't know, honey or sweetheart or something like that. You usually wouldn't call them partner of greatness. Um, so I think this shows where the Macbeth's ambition lies. And we'll see that word show up in this scene. It'll be um, a word that shows up a lot and is one of the main themes of the play, ambition and the, the danger of ambition. So the other thing I want to point out is the timing of this letter. Lady Macbeth reads this letter um, from Macbeth. So obviously he had to have written it in the past. So when did he write it? Well, he talks about in here, um, well, as I stood wrapped in wonder of it, came missives from the king who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor. So that's the first scene that Macbeth is in. I believe that's 1-3. If I, yes, 1-3. So the end of 1-3, Ross and Angus enter, and they tell Macbeth he's Thane of Cawdor. And then he writes this letter. So he writes about what the witches said to him, and he writes about the second greeting, the second prophecy, uh, Thane of Cawdor coming true. And of course, is excited about the third prophecy coming true. What Lady Macbeth doesn't know is that since he wrote this letter, he's seen Duncan and not been awarded the crown, but that Malcolm has been named heir to the throne. So Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are in two different places with this. Lady Macbeth is still full of hope that this will come true, him becoming king, whereas Macbeth is... Um, you know, more resolved that this is trickier than it might appear on the surface. Anyway, Lady Macbeth goes on now, no longer reading the letter, but using her own words. Gloms thou art and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet I do fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldest be great, art not without ambition, keyword but without the illness should attend it. And here illness means ruthfulness. So Macbeth has ambition, she says, but he doesn't have the ruthlessness to take what he wants. What thou wouldest highly, so what thou would want greatly, 
thou wouldest holily. So like holy. Um, basically, what you want, Macbeth, you also want to get fairly. And Lady Macbeth's point is that to get what you want in life, you can't play by the rules. You have to take it. You can't wait for it to be given to you. Uh, would, wouldest not play false, and yet wouldest wrongly win. Thou dost have great gloms, that which cries, though thus thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be undone. So that's a very confusing sentence. And part of the reason why that's so confusing is that Lady Macbeth is using really ambiguous language. She doesn't say murder. She doesn't say assassinate. She doesn't say kill the king. She says it and that and um, uh, wouldest have. Uh, so her language is, you know, scary, but it's it's guarded still. She's not outright saying that you should murder the king. She's more of hypothesizing about Macbeth's character than putting a plan of action into place. And I think that's a very important distinction. Hi thee hither. So here's where she does have some, some action. Hi thee hither, basically come here. Hi thee hither that, I'm, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. The golden round would be a crown, and uh, fate and metaphysical aid would be what's happened and what the witches predicted, um, that he is Thane of Cawdor, so it seems like both are guiding him toward the crown. And basically, hie thee hither that I may pour my spirits in thine ear means when you get here, I'm going to convince you to do what it takes to become the next king. Okay. So all of this is interrupted by a messenger who enters and uh, she says, what is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him? Who wert so would have informed for preparation. So she's pretty upset, right? Like, is not thy master, meaning Macbeth, is not Macbeth. Like, how, why am I just finding out about this right now? That the king is coming to our castle and we're expected to host him. That'd be a big deal, right? You got to put away laundry and, you know, make some food and stuff. But beyond that, all of a sudden, what Macbeth, or I'm sorry, what Lady Macbeth was talking about hypothetically is now something that can happen for real, like in reality. It's one thing to say that they should take the crown from Duncan. It's a whole nother thing for Duncan all of a sudden to be spending his evening there um, in their castle. So the stakes have been raised, uh, so to speak. Uh, so please you, it is true, our Thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him who, almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than would make up his message. So basically, Macbeth was riding his horse really fast, but someone was able to get here and tell us, uh, to give us a bit of a heads up. Lady Macbeth says, give him tending. He brings great news. Messenger exits. So now that the opportunity is present, Lady Macbeth realizes that she needs to call on some help if she wants to take the crown from Duncan. And the help she calls on is from the devil. So this is where Lady Macbeth's words get pretty severe. And I want to point out that a page ago, she could not even say the word murder. And, um, you know, now she's, she's going to say some words, so to speak. This is a very famous monologue. And we'll explain some of the interesting passages in it, I promise. It starts with a sound effect, um, which is probably imagined in Shakespeare's time, unless I had a bird somewhere. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. So a raven would have been a bad omen. It's one of those sort of like evil birds in Shakespeare's time. So the fact that she hears a raven and that the raven sounds hoarse uh, is a big implication that something bad is going to happen, at least to her. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. So that's the confusing line. This is the unsex me here speech or unsex me monologue. And this is a soliloquy, Lady Macbeth's alone on stage, um, but we're also hearing her thoughts. And um, 
she's not really talking as much to herself as she's talking to the audience and especially to these spirits. And what does she want these spirits, these spirits of hell, these demons to do? She wants them to unsex her, which means to take off her womanhood. And this is a very confusing passage. Um, it's very charged language, I know. So I'll do my best to explain it here. So basically in this time, it was not thought that women uh, would be capable of something like murder, at least a, a grisly murder. Now, witches are being put to death all the time, and the witches are almost always women. Um, so they were believed to be susceptible to evil, that they could be controlled by the devil, but of their own volition, committing something like murder, that was unheard of. Now, we, of course, know nowadays that that's not the case, that all people, sadly, are capable of committing terrible acts. But there is something to be said that I think even today, we're more surprised in the news when a violent act is carried out by a woman than we are by a man. So there is some real carryover from this. So basically, she wants to throw off her womanhood and instead be filled from the toe to the top, so her entire body full of direst cruelty, um, so pure, darkest, most um, potent cruelty. So take off the parts of womanhood like tenderness and um, maternal instincts and caring for others and replace it with cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. So thickening her blood and stopping up the passage to um, remorse, right? So she doesn't feel remorseful for deeds like uh, murder, um, that nothing comes between her purpose and what she wants to do to carry out that purpose. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. So again, interesting language. So when she says, come to my, <laughs> words I've never said on YouTube before. Uh, when she says, come to my women's breasts and take my milk for gall, um, she means take, you know, what gives people life, especially in a pre-formula day and age, um, breastfeeding, to replace that with gall, which is like what's in the, the stomach and the liver, like stomach acid. So take the, the nourisher of all life when it's born and replace it with something that destroys. I mean, if you've ever, you know, spat up a little bit, you know that stomach acid is not pleasant. It, it burns and she wants to fill herself with that instead. So it's, it's a very clear metaphor of replacing what makes her, you know, the stereotypical woman at this time with someone who would be evil and capable of carrying out an evil act. Uh, let me see where we're at. Uh, come thick night and pale thee in the dunnest smoke of hell. Dunnest means darkest. That my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. And then Macbeth enters. So that last bit is she she calls on night itself to uh, use the darkest smoke in hell to cover the heavens so the heavens cannot see what her knife is going to do and cry out for her to hold or stop. Um, and that's pretty similar to when Macbeth says, uh, stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. Um, so again, this idea that like, if heaven saw what was happening, uh, it would stop it. Because, you know, especially with a king, they believed kings were divinely put on the throne. Um, they also acknowledge that as humans, we have something like a conscious, uh, where we have remorse and uh, things that keep us from doing terrible acts like that. Um, common sense, for instance, but she wants all that to be blocked out, basically giving herself into evil. And uh, it's a crazy monologue, but it's phenomenal. I feel a little guilty breaking it up like that, but I wanted to make sure you understood um, what it is. But if you ever see uh, uh, someone playing Lady Macbeth, who's doing a phenomenal job, this is a standout monologue. It's nearly, I think, perfectly paced and has just some very powerful visceral language. And it's quite an introduction to a character. She's been on stage for like four minutes. Um, anyway, Macbeth enters. Uh, and one of the things I want to point out is he just returned from war. 
So he could have died. Who knows how long he's been away, at least a substantial amount of time. And this is the first time she's seen him. But notice her greeting for him. It goes great. It goes right into great gloms worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. The all hail hereafter being the king, all hail Macbeth, right? And um, so immediately greeted with his promotion and uh, what she believes he'll become. She says, thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in this instant. Macbeth says, my dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. Um, so he doesn't quite change the subject, but he, he says, you know, Duncan's coming. That could mean a few things. It could mean like we need to get ready, or it could mean like, what are we going to do with this knowledge um, that I'm supposed to be king, apparently, and now Duncan's going to be here. Uh, I think what Macbeth means is we need to get ready. I don't think his mind is quite on the murder like Lady Macbeth says. Lady Macbeth says, and when goes hence tomorrow as he proposes, oh, never shall sun that morrow see, meaning he will never see the sun tomorrow. Basically, the first time she says, let's kill Duncan tonight. And we get a stage direction there. Um, Macbeth's reaction, and this is why I think he was not thinking of murder when he said Duncan comes here tonight. Lady Macbeth says about his reaction, your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. So again, we see this theme that um, uh, happened earlier in the play when Malcolm was talking to Duncan, uh, just in that last scene, correct? I'm going to start getting them confused as I've spent more and more time reading this. Yeah, just in that last scene, uh, one four, where uh, Malcolm's talking about the Thane of Cawdor being executed and he looked so remorseful. And Duncan says, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. So that's pretty similar to your face. My Thane is a book where men may read strange matters. Um, again, this idea of like controlling what's on your face so that others don't realize what's happening. And then she tells him what to do. She says to beguile. Now beguile means deceive. To beguile the time look like the time. So what that means is to trick people at this time, look like what time it is. And what time it is, is it's a party. The king's coming. It's a great celebration of victory. So basically look happy. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. So again, that you know uh, binary there, those opposites. Look like the flower, but be the serpent under it. Face looks like the flower. Thoughts are those of a serpent. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. So it's interesting, this language, um, you know, I'll take care of tonight, and everyone would have expected Lady Macbeth to take care of everything with the feast and all that. That was her role as a hostess, as a woman. But what she's actually talking about taking care of tonight is murdering the king. Um, and when they do that, the rest of their nights and days will have solely sovereign sway and masterdom, basically meaning absolute power because they'll be king and queen. Macbeth just says, we will speak further. Lady Macbeth, only look up clear to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Um, so I'm going to take care of everything. To alter favor here means to alter your expression and um, to fear is like obviously to frighten. And uh, basically what she's saying is if you can keep your expression under control, there's nothing to be afraid of. I will take care of all of the rest. So we see this huge change in uh, Lady, well, maybe not a huge change, but significant change in Lady Macbeth from theorizing and not even saying words like murder out loud, using this sort of uncharged, ambiguous language to talk about um, her thoughts on this matter of, of Duncan being the king instead of Macbeth, um, going all the way to saying, I will take care of the murder and, you know, calling on the devil for help and, and going through with it. Um, and that's because the opportunity has presented itself. Um, and she knows that if she doesn't do it now, she may never have a chance like this again. Um, so she's going to plan on murdering Duncan. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's a, it's an introduction to the character for sure. Lady Macbeth is a, a famous character for many reasons, and this is one of them. Maybe a final note here. Um, this play is called Macbeth. 
usually that means uh you know the title character speaks the most except maybe in julius caesar where he uh no spoilers but he doesn't speak much especially in the second act or second half of the play um but macbeth has the most lines in this play by far but at least in these early scenes when lady macbeth's on stage she outspeaks him by like four to one if you look at this uh, Lady Macbeth has all these lines and Macbeth just says, uh, we will speak further uh, after that huge, uh, you know, how many lines is that? Almost 10, 12 lines. We will speak. He has half a line. Um, and it's because Lady Macbeth has the power in these scenes. And that's so revolutionary for, um, for women at this time in Shakespeare's time. I mean, women couldn't even be on stage at Shakespeare's time. Men were playing women. And there are some definite, uh, you know, uh, as you like it, uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Cleopatra, Antony and Cleopatra, plays with big female characters, much ado. But, um, you know, Lady Macbeth, by comparison, is definitely the one that uh, isn't speaking about love, is speaking about power and speaking about murder and things that just weren't expected for women to speak of. And I think that's why it's the unsex me speech, throw off my womanhood and let me accomplish what no one thinks a woman at this time can accomplish. So maybe there's something to be commended there with Lady Macbeth. There's a reason people are drawn to her character. Um, although the means by which she wants to achieve this power and uh, control of her own life is uh, quite disturbing to be sure. So anyway, that is act one, scene five of Macbeth. Uh, if you liked the video, I would really appreciate uh, you giving it a thumbs up it would really help. I don't know how the uh, algorithm is going to treat some of the language uh, in this scene. Lady Macbeth isn't very advertiser friendly, I don't think. Uh, but I really appreciate your support. Even just watching is uh, so, so appreciated. And uh, if you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments and I'll see you in Act one, scene six. If you want to read ahead and leave me some questions, I'd be happy to do my best to address them. Thank you so much for watching and happy reading.